This is Acts Part 2, Lesson 4 of our Precept Upon Precept study um, of the Book of Acts, and I'm glad y'all are here, and others may join us, and so I may have to take a second and click them in, but um, we're glad we're here. So we're gonna, we'll go ahead and get started with prayer and um, get into our discussion. Gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for your preservation of your word, for the promises, for the grace you've poured out on us, for the lessons that we're learning, and we ask, Father, that you would guide us in that, that you would keep us on track, and that you would have us learn what it is that you want us to take from this, that this isn't just a good story, and this isn't just information that puffs us up, but this is solid information that can be life altering and can cause us to go out and do the purposes that you would have for us that you set apart for each one of us before the foundation of the world so we ask that you help us to know what that is help us again stay on track in our discussion we thank you for everybody who could be here and that those who will join us in uh, the recording later and get to see this later we thank you for that as well and just ask for everything and thank you for it in Jesus name and for his sake as well. Amen. Okay, so we're all here. Um, if you'll go ahead and mute yourself so you can mute and unmute as we go through the discussion. Like I said to some that were on here a minute ago, um, I think if you hit your space bar, it'll mute and unmute. You can test that out as you answer questions if you're not on phone, if you're on a computer. Um, don't know how it works on an iPad. So again, you'd have to figure that out. Sorry. Um, okay, so this week we moved on and this is a his book of history. So as we're studying it, um, a lot of times with precept upon precept studies, with the inductive study method, we study different books differently, but this is a book of history. So knowing what type of literature it is, is important. Um, who, just remind me, who do we believe wrote this? The Book of Acts. I know it's inspired Luke. by Luke. Luke, right. Um, we've seen him uh, in previous chapters mentioned. He obviously is at times either with Paul and he's writing firsthand accounts or he's getting the information somehow and he's writing it down. A few things we know about Luke is he wrote the book of Luke and Luke is Greek. Um, he's also a physician. So we can see in the book of Luke and we at his purpose in writing the book of Luke, not really as much the purpose in writing it, but the purpose in how he wrote the book of Luke, I believe is similar to the book of Acts, which is he wanted to give a chronological account. Um, the other synoptic gospels have different purposes. There are obviously different stories that, um, different accounts of things that happened in that earthly ministry and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that were different focuses for different writers. Um, and God inspired each one of them and used them, used their experience and used their personalities as well. And same with Luke. But with Luke being a physician, he was methodical. And that makes sense that he would want a chronological account. And the beauty of it is we can take each of the other gospels and figure out timing of the events being mentioned by the book of Luke, which is also, which is awesome. And then we see at the beginning of Acts, it seems to be, he's writing to the same person and it seems that he is writing the book of Acts. So just like his account of the gospel, he wasn't necessarily there for all of those events. He collected the information. In the book, book of Acts, we see that he's also experiencing it firsthand at times, but maybe not always. What we're going to do today, as we look at chapters 18 and 19, um, there's various ways we could look at this. I've done it, you know, paragraph by paragraph. We are going to follow through like that, but we're going to just try to see, like, where are they, who is involved, who's being named, and the general events that are happening so that we can, in that, I mean, I could have put something else up there like, what are the patterns? What are the new things? There's all kinds of different ways, but those are things that we want to be able to look at, that we want to be able to see, and we've seen some patterns already. Now, the first part of the book, when we studied Acts 1, 
the main person that seemed to be the one that spoke up the most was the apostle Peter. He walked with Jesus for the three and a half years. Then in the second half of Acts, the shift, the focus has shifted. Not that Peter is not important. It's just the focus has shifted and we're hearing from and watching and seeing more about Paul. But this two, these two chapters this week, we are actually seeing even more people. So one of the questions, we also had seen Barnabas on the scene, and he's kind of gone off the scene in these chapters and going forward. But again, that doesn't mean he's unimportant. Prior to Paul coming on the scene and, and meeting up with Barnabas and going on the first missionary journey, we saw Philip and uh, others as they went off and evangelized and began to do what Jesus told them to do in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 which is that they were going to receive the Holy Spirit, but then they were going to go first, they were going to stay in Jerusalem, and then they were going to take the message from Jerusalem, where they, obviously they were going to tell it to, does he go anywhere else? He goes to Macedonia. Um, no, Macedonia is mentioned, but Paul didn't go there. Um, Paul goes on to Ephesus. And, um, but we do see. Um, he goes to Asia. Okay. Caesarea. Uh, Caesarea. He, he comes back to, um, eventually he comes back to Antioch and then he goes on to um, Galatia and the Phrygian uh, areas. And then we also see someone else coming on the scene. Who is that? Apollos. Apollos and Apollos is in um, Ephesus. Um, okay, so you could put, I mean, it could be a lot because there's a whole lot of moving parts in this chapter, but um, we want to at least get an idea so that when we glance at it, we kind of remember some of what's going on and we're going to go in more detail. Um, so we're going to look at chapter 18. I'm unfrozen on my end, which is good. Um, and so, first, Paul is still in Athens, but he goes to Corinth. And in Corinth, he meets Aquila and Priscilla. Priscilla. Okay. Um, these two show up several different times in other parts of scripture, as you saw this week, as you look them up, and they're going to show up um, here and in other places. And, and, in the future. Um, I've pointed this out before. I want to point it out again. When they're first mentioned, it says in verse two, he found a certain Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. And the reason is because Claudius had commanded all Jews to leave Rome. So the Jews have been kicked out of Rome, which that's Italy and the capital of Italy, and they are now found by Paul in Corinth, um, and which is, if you looked at your map, you have an idea that's in the Acacia region, um, and down here, and it's not far from Athens. Athens um, is a pretty small, not really large or, or very active city, where Corinth is. Corinth is a center of a lot of things. So Corinth would be a much more, uh, much bigger city and bigger area and much more influential and important. Now, we found out some really interesting things uh, that we've not seen before. When Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla, we know, they're, um, we know that they're Jews, but they also um, are what? What is their occupation? Tent makers. Tent makers. And why is this significant? Why is it significant? Because Paul was a tent maker also. Paul was a tent maker also. So they have this in common. And why is Paul being a tent maker and them being a tent, tent being tent makers also? Why is that significant? What does it show us? They could work, they could work together. Yes. Now, why is it significant that we're told that Paul is working? 
He's low on funds. <laughs> okay. Oh well, yeah. He needs <laughs> subsidence. <laughs> yeah. Because, and you don't really see it said there, but you see that <clears throat> he's going into the synagogue and he's reasoning in the synagogue. We know this is Paul's patterns, right? So he's going to the synagogue as he does. If there is a synagogue, he goes there. So on the Sabbath, he's reasoning with the Jews, but basically the rest of the week, he's, he's tent making. And that's kind of an interesting little story until you realize that when Silas and Timothy come down from Macedonia, he gets to then be able to devote himself full time. And so that's the difference is prior to this, he had to make tents seemingly to provide for himself. And if you've read any of Paul's writings, you see this idea. He doesn't go to a place and burden them. He doesn't now, he's worthy of it. He's very worthy of their financial support, but he doesn't do that to them. He either provides for himself or in this case, it could either be Silas and Timothy came and worked while Paul devoted himself, or as you saw in your cross-referencing about the city of Philippi, what did Paul say about the city of Philippi where it came to gifts of money? They were very generous. Yes. And their generosity provided for Paul on more than one occasion. It was, you sent gift on more than one occasion. So more and more. And sometimes they didn't send because they didn't have opportunity, whether that means um, there wasn't a need or they didn't have somebody to send it by or they didn't have the funds at the time. But I, I, I read it and I couldn't quite figure out. He just said, you just take whatever he says, but when they can, as often and more often than not, the, Phili the, the people in Philippi sent gifts to help provide for Paul or Timothy or whoever was with Paul. So when Timothy and Silas come down from Macedonia, now you have to back up to previous chapters. When Paul left Berea, which is in Macedonia, and was sent to Athens because of the threats that were going on, and he was sent away, Timothy and Silas stayed with Paul's command or guidance or directions or instructions, whatever you're going to call them, to come to him. He was in Athens, but then he went to Corinth. And that's where he met Priscilla and Aquila, and they, they, haven't come, they didn't come until Paul had left and went to Corinth. I, I don't, we don't know why. We don't know if it was just a timing issue. Maybe they were waiting on the collection of funds. Maybe God left them there for a reason to continue the work, but it was a, it was a threatening area. Whatever reason, we now see them together with Paul uh, from Macedonia in Corinth. Now, Paul then devotes himself fully to um, the word and testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Okay, this is Paul's goal, to take them from where they are to the knowledge that they need for salvation. And it, in some cases, it's really easy. They're, they're right there and they go, oh, we've been waiting on the Messiah. Oh, the Christ, that, that means the Messiah, um, is Jesus. And, and let's just, you know, connect the dots and fill in the gap. Otherwise, it's not easy. There's resistance. And in this case, that begins to happen again, right? As he had spoken with dedication and devotion, they began to resist and they blasphemed. That's always against God. That's not against Paul. And he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood is upon your head. I am clean. From now on, I go to the Gentiles. So he gave the Jews their opportunity. He departed from there, being at the synagogue, and he went to the house of a certain man named Titius Justus, or Titius And Titius Justus is, what is his, um, what do we know about him? He was a worshiper of God. Yes. And his house is next to the synagogue, right? Yes. And he also, and, and also there's Crispus, 
who's the leader of the synagogue. Because they would have had an organization. So Crispus is a leader of the synagogue and Paul, and he believed, so he now has become a believer with his whole household and many Corinthians. So if you're marking in your margin, numbers being added, I mark this as another place where numbers are being added, uh, people, obviously. Um, and when they heard and were believing, they were being baptized. This is going to be the practice. Again, we're looking for those patterns. Um, now, then we see that Paul is told in a vision something from the Lord. And what is that? Not to be afraid. Right. Okay, so there's a vision. And he's told to not fear. Go on, go on speaking and not be silent. Right. Continue speaking. Don't be silent because it says, I am with you. And did Paul not know that? Paul knew that. But here it goes on to say, I'm with you and no man will attack you in order to harm you. For I have many people in this city, which is this is great news, right? This is awesome. And as a result, he settled there for a year and six months. And this is the first time we've seen Paul knowingly stay somewhere for a, a I mean, sometimes we'd say for some time, maybe a few months, but for a year and a half, he stays with the comfort and the encouragement from the Lord that no harm is gonna to come to him. Now, it didn't say no one was going to attack him. It said they weren't gonna attack him so as to do him harm. So he has no fear and he can go on. Now, when you cross-reference to the book of Corinthians, what did you learn about what Paul said when he first came to the people in Corinth? What was his, how did he describe himself? Um, he didn't feel very sure of himself about the word or how he was preaching. Right. Um, he talks about that and he talks about like fear and trembling, right? Um, he does not want their faith to rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Yes. And he said, you're absolutely right. And he also said, and the power of God was being shown. So, um, so there was both that he didn't want, he didn't come with a persuasive speech and a, a great way of talking. Paul does not describe himself that way. And it's, it's over, said over and over, but that it's just the powerfulness of God's word and his faithfulness to it and God doing powerful things through him. So the power of God is being shown and it's not resting on reason. It's not, you know, like just human reason or the ability to be a good speaker, good orator. Um, I don't doubt that Paul was, and I don't doubt that he was powerful, but he says that of himself. But he also came with fear and trembling. Think back to why he left Berea, why he left some of these other cities when he did. They were basically hurrying him out. The, the believers, his, his companions, were basically hurrying him down on the road because there was a lot of opposition. So when he came to Corinth, which is a bigger place than Athens, um, bigger place than probably Berea, he came slightly fearful. He still did it though. Don't miss that. You know, Paul can say all day long that he was afraid, but we got to remember Paul still did it. He knew that God was with him. He just didn't know what was going to happen each place. So to have this time, of comfort and and just knowing that he could be that bold and speak out had to be great you know just to sit back and stay now he didn't sit back and take a vacation but to be able to rest and stay the other thing is he's told stay you know he's told keep going keep saying this here so he's not told to leave yet sometimes his circumstances and direct guidance from God told him to not go places or to go places. 
and to leave at particular times. Now, as soon as we hear that, <laughs> we see starting in verse 12 that we, we see this new guy, um, Gallio, and he's a proconsul um, of Acacia, and that's the area that Corinth is in. He's a proconsul of Acacia. Um, that would be a Roman, Roman official. Um, and the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul. Now, obviously, this is not every genetic Jew. These are the people that are unbelievers, that are Jewish. They rose up. They dragged him before Galileo and tell me what happened. What were they accusing Paul of? Worshiping God contrary to the law. Okay. Now, think about that for a second because we got to figure out it because mine is lowercase l. Sometimes you'll see uppercase l, which is kind of referring to the law, as we would call like the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. Um, here it's lowercase. So you have to stop and think about this. Here's a Roman proconsul having all these Jews bringing a Jew to them and saying he's teaching about, he's persuading men to worship God contrary to the law. So is this Roman law or no. is this Jewish law? I say Roman law. Okay, that would be that would make sense. He's taken them to, and this has been this has happened before. You know, the uh, forgot which guy's name in a previous chapter also did this and said he's t trying to persuade people to, and actually the Jews did this. He's trying to persuade people to go contrary to Caesar, which would be the Roman law, contrary to Caesar. And if you understand anything about the Roman culture at that time, worshiping Caesar was part of the Roman culture. He was considered a God. He was considered to be worshiped. One of many. I mean, they had tons of gods, but he would have been up there. He was their king. He was their leader. And you weren't to worship another king. And they're saying they're, he, that Paul was claiming Jesus is king. Jesus is king. They're right about that. But they're trying to say to these Roman officials, he's counseling civil disobedience. He's telling people to go against Roman law. So they're using this wrinkle. They're, they're using the Roman law. But here, this, the reaction, because so at first, that's exactly what I thought too, that he was, they were doing it again. They were bringing him for a Roman and saying, he's telling people to do something against the law worshiping God against the law. And before Paul gets a chance to even speak, Gallio speaks up and basically says, go away. I am not going to judge between parts of your law. I don't want to have anything to do with this. It wasn't, he probably wasn't ignorant. He might have not cared. I mean, it sounds like he doesn't care. He doesn't want to have anything to do with these differences within Judaism. This is a little different than before because they brought up Caesar before. Here, he says, just go away. Now, he's, he, he goes on, he says a little bit more, and as a result of this being kind of dismissed, you know, I don't, I'm not even gonna hear your case, the Jews grab Sophanes, who they're now saying is the leader of the synagogue. Sophanes. And they began to beat him. So you've heard of Crispus as the leader of the synagogue. Now you see Sothenes. So this may be after Crispus believed and was kicked out, Sothenes was now the new leader of the synagogue. Now I'm adding a little bit, just saying maybe that's what this means. We're not going to die on that hill. And he, so he's the, they took him though, took hold of him and they started beating him and Gallio didn't care. He didn't stop that either. He just didn't want to have anything to do with this. Move on. He just didn't want to have anything to do with it. But then it says Paul remained many days longer, and he, but then he took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria. And who came with him? Okay. Now, let's think for a second where Syria is. Syria is where 
Antioch of Syria is. That's north of the of Jerusalem, north of Samaria, north. So it says here that Paul is setting out for Syria, but that's not exactly where he goes yet. It's just his intention, right? And it says Priscilla and Aquila went with him. So he, um, okay, so what happened? We've got the Galileo dismissal. And then you've got Paul leaving. And Aquila and Priscilla go with him. Um, but here it says Priscilla and Aquila. I just like to point these things out. Because <laughs> before we were introduced to Aquila, a certain Jew who had a wife named Aquila, Priscilla, sorry. And here we've got who went with Paul is Priscilla and Aquila. In the Greek construction of a sentence, the order of names is important. Just interesting. Um, and they stopped first, or he stopped first in Sincretia, sorry, however you say that, Sincrea, Sincrea. <laughs> and he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. You looked up this week what possible vow this might be, and what was that? Law of Moses. The vow, well, it was from the Law of Moses. It was the vow, the vow of a Nazarite. Um, we don't know for sure that that's what this was, but within the vow of the Nazarite, you had to, for whatever period of time that you felt that you were dedicating yourself, and this is male or female, dedicating yourself to God, that during that time, you would not eat or drink anything that had to do with the grapes from a vine, even the seeds, even the skins, nothing. You had nothing to do with it. And you also let your hair grow. And it said, let your hair grow long. So you just let your hair grow. No razor touched your head. Or, and that, that's a weird way of putting it for us, but that would have been how they would have cut their hair. Not necessarily with scissors or obviously with clippers. They wouldn't have had um, you know, clippers back then like that. So the idea is you did not cut your hair during the time of your Nazarite vow. vow. So if this is Paul ending a Nazarite vow, he had dedicated himself to the Lord before this, maybe this was his, during his second missionary journey. Maybe he started this, it doesn't say, and he didn't tell us back then, but there would have been a period of time, and he's been in Corinth for one year and six months. His hair could have grown quite a bit during that time. And, but we don't know how far back this goes, but if this is the ending of keeping that vow, he's shaved, he's cutting his hair as he moves forward. Okay. Um, if this, I, it doesn't say anywhere that I know of that to start a Nazarite vow, you cut your hair. It just says in the Nazarite vow time frame, you do not cut your hair. Now, do you know a famous person who Samson. was Samson? There you go. We know about his hair. And as the strength was in his hair, we, that's kind of the way it is said, but we, that's more, that would end up almost being a little superstitious. So I'm going to put that aside for a second, but it was in the commitment that Samson was given in utero to his parents that he was going to be that person for his entire life, that he was going to be set apart by this Nazarite vow. And therefore his hair grew very, very long throughout the course of his life. And he would not have partaken of anything that had to do with the fruit of the vine, the grapes, um, if he was keeping the vow. And then we know Samson's story. And eventually his hair did grow back out. So it does seem to indicate that there's a connection with Samson between long hair and his strength, but really the connection is the dedication to God and keeping your vows. Now here's the thing. We may find this silly. We may never, never, never <coughs> care to take up a Nazarite vow. You may say that's Old Testament, that's law, that's Moses, that's Jews. I don't want to have anything to do with that, or I've never thought of it. <laughs> I, you know, whatever, ever, you, you just, maybe this is the first time you've ever even heard of it. None of that particularly matters. Really what matters is God says if you make a vow, you better keep it. 
And he also says, maybe don't make a vow because you need to keep it. And we have stories throughout the Bible <coughs> that illustrate the necessity of keeping your vow. So just don't be casual about that. And so for instance, if you have felt like you came under a teaching and you came under a conviction, for instance, and, and I'm not judging here, I'm just giving an example that you felt the Bible really did speak to tithing and that the tithes should go to your church, to the, the, the storehouse. And so you committed yourself and said, I am going to tithe. I very much suggest that you do that. Does God need your money? Nope. Did God ask you to make that vow? Only that's between you and God. Are you told in scripture you have to? Not really, because we're not under law, we're under grace. But I will cause you to think for a second and just start to contemplate without asking. This is more rhetorical. I want you to think about it. I believe. The tithe is the minimum and offerings and more are even above that. So that that's coming from me as my opinion. So I believe scripture upholds it, but just throwing that out there. <clears throat> but if I commit and I vow that my husband and I are going to tithe, I better keep that vow. So that's one of the things here. That's a lot for that one little verse, but we're going to move on. He comes after Sincrea. He goes to Sincrea, and then he goes to Ephesus. And I'm just going to put Syria in parentheses because that he's not there yet, but that's his goal. You know, like his thought, we know, we see here that he's planning on going to Syria. Priscilla and Aquila go with him. I've got that over there. Priscilla and Aquila go with him to Ephesus. And then it immediately says he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So basically you just have this idea of he gets to Athens. I'm sorry, Ephesus. He gets to Ephesus. He, they get settled wherever they're getting settled. He, you know, separates himself from them long enough to go to the synagogue, as is his pattern, and he reasons with the Jews. They, the people in the synagogue, asked him to stay a while longer, but he didn't consent. Taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you again if God wills, and he set sail from Ephesus. So it just appears that he's there for a short period, at least one Sabbath. He's not there for long. Who stays? Who stays in Ephesus? Priscilla. Yes. So, so Priscilla. So Paul leaves, um, and Priscilla and Aquila stay in Ephesus. They go with him, and they stay. And that's important because we see the next thing. He left Ephesus. He landed at Caesarea. How do you spell Caesarea? Sorry. Okay. Caesarea, which is, if you looked it up on the map, is on the coast right above Jerusalem. Caesarea was a Roman city named after Caesar, um, but it was there in Judea or in the area between Samaria, maybe. No, it's above Samaria, but it's, it's north of Jerusalem. And he landed there, and then it says he went up, greeted the church, and he went down to Antioch. So what's the went up part? Where do you think he went when he went up? Kay asked this question this week. Jerusalem. Possibly, and I'm going to put it in a bracket. It's, it says greeted the church is what it said. Right. right. And we had seen in a previous chapter that there is a church in Jerusalem. That was the first time we'd seen that when they had that controversy. But he went from Caesarea, he went up, and then he went down. And the down is to Antioch. Now, I know for us, this is always hard. So I always like to remind, I mean, it's, it, I have to convert it in my brain is the point. We look at a map and we see up as going north. And that's what our map would show. But Jerusalem set at the highest elevation in Judea and that area of Israel, it set up 
on the mountains range there. So anytime it's ever referred to going to Jerusalem, it talks about going up. I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Kay asked this question. You can, you can think about your own reasons for why it's saying that. But even I think about like going up to the temple, you know, going up to where God has decided that that's the city of his choice. So I think there's also kind of like a spiritual up as well as a geographical going up a hill. So that anytime you get up there, guess what happens when you leave? You go down. And so they, elevation wise go down but also from Caesarea at the coast that would be sea level we know that's like the lowest point anywhere not that exact point in the world but anywhere you're at sea level you're at the lowest and anything from there would be up so you could say from Caesarea to Antioch would be up but it doesn't say it that way from Caesarea he went up and then it says he went down to Antioch. So it's kind of in there that it seems like he probably went to Jerusalem. He met with the church. What do you think he's doing as he comes back on this trip and ends up in Antioch? What would we call this? At this point when he's in Antioch, what would we say? This is the end of what? end of his second missionary journey. His first missionary journey started in Antioch and ended in Antioch. The second missionary journey started in Antioch and it ends in Antioch. Okay. After this, it says he goes through Galatia and Phrygia. So he's left Antioch again, and he's headed back out. This would be the start of the third missionary journey. And this would be the end of the second. And that's like all said really quickly, and but just kind of unpacking it a little bit. But then in verses um, 24 and on through the end of the chapter, you're introduced to Apollos. Um, so you've got Apollos. And he's in, Apollos is in Ephesus. Is it, it's Ephesus, right? Yeah. Pa Apollos is in Ephesus. Who's been to Ephesus before him? PNA. Yes. PNA, <laughs> Priscilla and Aquila and Paul. Okay, so Paul wasn't there for very long, but he did teach in the synagogue, and Priscilla and Aquila stayed, and Apollos comes. Now, what you hear about Apollos is pretty much all good. He's Alexandrian by birth. Does anybody know what that means? What would you call him nationality wise? Greek. A Greek. Right, his name kind of says it too. Apollos, that's like a Greek god. Um, Apollos, he's Alexandrian by birth. He's an eloquent man. And he came to Ephesus and he was mighty in the scriptures. So he's either a genetic Jew who happened to have been born in Alexandria and given a Greek name, or he is Greek and he proselytized to Judaism and he's mighty in the scriptures. Like he's, he's very studied. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he was fervent in spirit, and he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. Okay, so let's just think about this for a second. And he, well, and what goes on is that he was speaking out boldly in the synagogue. So he's doing the same thing Paul does, going to the Jews uh, first, and. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, so this means that Priscilla and Aquila are where when they hear him? In the synagogue. They're doing this work also. They're continuing this work, or at least they're attending. They took him aside and explained the way of God more accurately. Now, what can we learn from just this part right now that we could apply to our own lives?
Did they call him out in front of everybody? Did they blast him? Did they refute him in front of everybody? Nope. They listened and they recognized that he knew this much, but he didn't have the rest of the story, right? Because knowing the baptism of John, what was John's whole goal and purpose? What was John's ministry? Repent. Repent. He said that over and over and over again. That was John's key word, main word. Repent on the pathway to salvation, right? Okay. So repentance is so important. And it was repentance for the forgiveness of sins. I just read the first two chapters of Mark, by the way, and it mentions John and John's baptism. And his, his statement was repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And his other point and goal was he was prophesied from Isaiah being the one that was going to make way the straight way of the Lord, right? Clear the path, make it smooth. And you just not understand that if, if he was building roads and where roads weren't, that it would make it easier to get somewhere. That's his goal. That's his, that was his entire ministry. And when he had the opportunity and Jesus came to him for baptism, John says, I shouldn't even be doing this. You know, I'm not worthy to tie your shoe. But Jesus says, you need to do this. They needed that visual, and John had been told, when you see the one that the Holy Spirit comes down on like a dove, you know that's who the Messiah is. So when John saw that, and that did happen at Jesus' baptism, um, did Jesus need to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, by the way? No. 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 But he still did the action. And it, it proved to John who Jesus was. And at the moment, God in heaven, the Father said this. So you've got the sun in the water. You've got the voice of the Father. And you've got the Holy Spirit coming down between them and landing on Jesus in a visual way. And I don't know that it was a dove. It says just like a dove. But we'll just say it's a dove. Whatever visual. And the Father says this. This point, point, point is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You know, listen to him is what Jesus, what God would have been saying, verifying, validating, and it's the beginning of Jesus's earthly ministry. It sets things off. The next thing he does is he goes in the wilderness and on and on. There's more that happens, but they're being, you're, you have to remember that to be able to point back and say, what's going on with Apollos? He knows the scriptures at that time. That would be Old Testament. New Testament hadn't been written. At that time, it'd be the Old Testament. He knew the scriptures. He even knew the way of the Lord, but it doesn't say he knew Jesus. It doesn't say he knew that Jesus was Lord. It just said he knew the way of the Lord. And it says that he was fervent Oh, wait a minute. It does say Jesus. Sorry. <laughs> he, he knew the things concerning Jesus. So he could tell the stories. He knew the events and what had happened. Um, and he was acquainted with John's baptism. He could have been there to see Jesus's baptism because he, of John's baptism. We don't know that, but it could have been. But they took him, they being, who is named first? Sandy said it earlier, P&A, right? Priscilla and Aquila heard him, took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, since there's a whole bunch of women here, but there may be others that listen, I'm not bashing or praising one way or the other, but over the course of time, sometimes things are kind of twisted a little bit wrong. And basically women are told they can't speak, they can't teach, they can't say anything. I am not advocating for a bigger role than I'm supposed to have. Not, I am not. God and I have tried to work this out and I'm still learning. But I am saying we're not, we know, and we're not supposed to stay silent. And these two work hand in glove. They work together. 
And in these sentences now, Priscilla is not always, but here and twice, we see Priscilla named first two different times. And that's significant. And she, it's not like Priscilla and Aquila brought him aside and Priscilla fixed dinner while Aquila sat down and talked to him. It doesn't say that. The two of them instructed him in a more accurate understanding of things. He didn't know salvation yet. Um, as a result, he does know salvation. As a result, the brethren encouraged him, wrote to the disciples to welcome him to Acacia, which would be back over there like where Athens and Corinth are. And they encouraged him to go. And he greatly helped the believers there through grace. The believers through grace. He didn't help them through grace. The people that were believers through grace, he greatly helped them. Now, would he have been able to help them if he wasn't a believer himself at this point? No, he's a believer. and. Um, he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So you can just imagine kind of like Paul, very steeped in scripture, totally against the church. And in that moment on the road and the three days after God got hold of him, changed, you know, filled in the gaps, brought him to truth. And now G Paul has all of that background going forward in a very powerful way. Same with Apollos. He goes forward from this point forward with truth because Aquila and Priscilla took him aside and tweaked what he knew and provided him with the truth of salvation. Okay, so the concern I have a lot of times is we hear somebody, we know they're close or maybe we're not steeped enough in scripture for us to know when they're wrong, but we know they're close if we do, and we're not willing to speak up. There's an old saying that says, between your brain, and your heart is about 18 inches, and this is the difference in heaven and hell. You can know these facts like Apollos did. He can know the truths and the stories of Jesus, but he hadn't yet received Jesus as his Savior and the Holy Spirit in his heart. And if we recognize that difference in a person, hopefully ourselves first, but if we recognize that difference in a person and we don't be a Priscilla and Aquila, we don't become like them, we're literally saying, go to hell. I don't care. I don't love you enough to tell you the truth. I care more about me I care more about you liking me. I care more about my peace and my comfort than I do telling you the difference in heaven and hell. Now, I can't send or keep somebody from heaven or hell. So just keep that in mind. But I have the opportunity to take part in being a Priscilla or an Aquila or both. Let's just say both of them, P and A. I get to take part. And it's, it's, it's an amazing, wonderful gift that God has given us to have this ministry to others. So keep that in mind. So we see, very interesting. So there's some differences from what we've seen before because the, the narrative has changed from Paul for a minute. Paul's traveling. Let's look at Apollos for a minute. You know, Luke is telling this. So now we're starting to see some other things going on because otherwise we begin to think that Paul's the only one. We don't even know where Barnabas is. We know he went to Crete, but we don't know where he went from that. So I'd say Barnabas is out there doing some great things, and others are as well. But Paul really is the powerhouse and, and a lot of the focus. Now, as we go into chapter 19, Paul is on his, has, has started his third missionary journey. And it says that, it came about that while Paul was, Apollo, sorry, was in Corinth. So that means he's left Ephesus. He's gone to Corinth. We were, he was encouraged to do so. And we see that he was um, um, encouraging the brethren there and he was refuting the Jews. But now we turn back to Paul and we see Paul passed through the upper country and he's come back to Ephesus. Okay. He was there briefly before he told them, if the Lord wills, I'll come back. So guess what? The Lord willed. <laughs> so we've got now Paul, 
again back in Ephesus. So Paul was there first and a Priscilla and Aquila, and then along came Apollos with a Priscilla and Aquila there, and now Paul comes back. Okay. It's important because we see what happens. And when you read, you did your cross-referencing this week. What did Paul say to the Corinthians when they were saying, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul. What did Paul say to him in his letter to the Corinthians? Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Yes. And did you receive it from me? No. Did you believe it? You believed, right? And they received the Holy Spirit from God, but he just said of their work, and they did work, they did things. Paul planted, Apollos came along and watered, but God caused the growth. And that's very important for us to re remember all the time. Um, and that's not here in Acts, but we saw the cross-referencing when Paul's talking to the people in Corinth. But as he comes to Ephesus, um, or maybe it was Ephesus, the Ephesians, sorry that he was talking to, I said Corinthians, but it might have been our Ephesians cross-reverence. Um, he finds this group of 12 men who are disciples. Now, we have a tendency to convert that in our heads, so we have to say, were these men that Paul found as disciples at this moment, were they believers? Not yet. Again, uh -huh. they, knew, they knew some. Weren't they bad? They weren't baptized by John in repentance. Yes, they knew the baptism of John. Now, what does that remind you of? That reminds you of the teaching of Apollos, right? So this group of men may have met Apollos, may have heard Apollos' teachings, but they don't have the complete story yet, just like Apollos didn't. Paul comes along, and maybe Paul knew the original teaching that Apollos was doing because he's probably met back with Priscilla and Aquila, but he meets this group and he asks them the question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, we've never even heard of that. We don't know what this Holy Spirit thing is. And then he says, into what then were you baptized? And they said the baptism of John. So they've come to the point of repentance belief that led to that repentance for the forgiveness of sins and they were baptized into forgiveness of sins but they haven't yet believed to the point of understanding Jesus as their savior and receiving the Holy Spirit so these are not believers yet they believed what they believed but they don't have the full story yet you can't leave people at repentance we can't leave them at understanding, believing in God. We've got to take them all the way. Our message has to take them. God takes them, not me. But my message has to include that you need a Savior. And Jesus is that Savior. And therefore, they're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul lays his hands on them. They receive the Holy Spirit. And then they began teach, speaking in tongues and prophesying. Okay. Have we ever seen teaching, speaking in tongues and prophesying before? Yes. And you went back and did some cross-referencing. When you did that, and, and she took you through the different accounts in Acts of people that got saved and received the Holy Spirit, is speaking in tongues always part of receiving the Holy Spirit? No. Sometimes I think y'all are afraid to answer. <laughs> no. No. In this early time, it was important for, like at Cornelius's house, for the other Jewish believers that came along with Peter to see evidence that was just as strong as what happened to them at the day of Pentecost. To put that seal and that understanding and that acknowledgement, that's what signs and wonders can do is show that power. But signs and wonders can be, do, be done by Satan and his, his people too. So we've got to be careful that that's what we're looking for all the time. Here, Paul understood Paulus's original teaching, it seems. He knew to ask these questions. He wasn't there. He didn't know these 12 men before. So here's another thing we need to remember. 
People can come into our churches. People could even come to our Bible studies. People could tell you what church they go to if it's not yours. In other words, they can identify with Christianity. But should we ask them questions? Maybe not right away. I mean, maybe right away. But over time, are you just accepting that they think they're saved? Or are you going to find out if they believe what is necessary for salvation? It's important. And it can be scary. It can be really, it really like, I can literally physically shake sometimes when I'm talking to somebody like that. Because number one, I know it's important. Number two, I want to get it right. And number three, I'll be honest with you, I don't want them to be upset with me. I don't want them to, to, to get mad at me. And the, one of the hardest groups for me in the very, very beginning were my family, where I should be comfortable and safe. But anyway, and I could go on, but I'll, I'll leave that. But just think about that. Paul doesn't just go and say, oh, we got a group of believers. They were believers of what they knew, but they had not yet received the Holy Spirit, which indicates they were not saved. Paul clears that up. It's only 12 men or about, it says about 12 men. He entered the synagogue. He continued to speak out boldly for three months. He reasoned and persuaded about the kingdom of God. Three months in the synagogue. I'm sure that surprises you that he went to the synagogue. Um, but when they began, in other words, the ones that heard, heard, the ones that were going to believe, believed. After that, they became hardened. The rest of them became hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way. Remember, the way is the a, a term used, meaning the people that are followers of Jesus. It says, when they began speaking evil of the way before the multitude, he withdrew and took away the disciples, the ones that believed, and he reasoned daily in the school of Tyrannus. And he did that for about two years. For two years. That's a long time. Two years and three months so far. Now, as a result of this, all the people who lived, it says all, all the people who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So as a result of, and here's, here's an interesting thing. It seems to be a bad thing that Paul is in the synagogue and is rejected. But a lot of times these types of situations force us out of where it's comfortable, force us out of what makes sense. To us, and honestly, it, it, it even, Paul's done this before, so it makes sense that Paul would go there. But he leaves and he goes to this other school, and look at the impact he has on the entire area region of Asia. Which, by the way, prior to this, Paul wanted to teach in Asia, and God had says no. And I had asked the question last week: Does God not want the people in Asia to know? And we all said no. That's not it. But here's the now, here's the why, here's the when. God wanted it in God's timing. And so he spends the two years, all the people in Asia, and throughout this time, extraordinary miracles are coming by the hand of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons are being carried from his body to the sick, diseases leaving them, and evil spirits are being cast out. And some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. So they're kind of like trying to, on the coattails. Remember that one guy that when Peter and John went to check things out and the people hadn't received the Holy Spirit there either and they lay hands on this other guy comes up and says, I want that power. This is a similar thing. These people are going, oh, this is kind of cool. He's casting out demons. He doesn't even have to be there. It's just his handkerchiefs and aprons that are taking away from him. And, and demons are being left out. So let's jump on this bandwagon and let's start calling on the name of Jesus and let's start using Paul's name. Name droppers. Let's name these, drop these names. But what's happening here? <laughs> what ends up happening? It's kind of a funny story. Did it work? 
No, the evil spirits didn't know who they were. They knew who Jesus was and they recognized Paul, but they did not know who these people were. Right. And, and out loud, they heard this. <laughs> and they, this evil spirit um, leaped on, it seemed like seven people, seven men of the Sceva, a, Jew, a Jewish chief priest, um, or seven sons, sorry, of, of one Sceva, um, leapt on all of them, overpowered them, and they run out of the house naked and wounded. Sorry, it's kind of funny. It's really not funny. <laughs> but it just shows that there are a lot of people out there that will use the name Jesus or Christianity or a church denomination or whatever, you know, whatever moniker you want. They may even say, I listen to K. Arthur. I listen to whatever big name you want to come up with. Um, and, and these things are uh, these name drops, you know, I have actually, you know, I'm going to call on that name and the evil spirits going, I know who Jesus is. I've heard of Paul. So that means think about that. This evil spirit had heard of Paul. <laughs> How powerful is Paul's ministry? It's, it's gotten to the, to the evil spirits. Think about all those evil spirits that are being cast out. This one knew about it. <laughs> you know, there's an awareness. We got to realize that as well. It's, it's real. That's the other thing. Evil spirits, demon possession is a real thing. Here in America, we tend to poo-poo it away. But um, these, these seven sons of Sceva are, are not recognized. They're overpowered and they have to run out naked. This became known to both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus and a fear fell on all of them. And that's a respectful fear. And the name of the Lord was being magnified, was being lifted up. Many also of those who had believed what happened as a result of this. What, what's the next thing that's probably a familiar story that happened as a result? In verse 18. And 19. They confessed their practices and then they took all their books that they had learned from and they burned them in the sight of all. And um, the, it was worth a lot of money of yeah. what they had burned, but they, they burned it. And I, I was, this just was amazing to me. Well, and, and I've got a note that says, this 50,000 pieces of silver was probably a drachma. And a drachma was a Greek coin or Greek drachma that would have represented like a day's wage. So all of these accumulation of all these books would have been about 50,000 days wages when you added it all up. So this is no small amount. And you know, a lot of times when we hear about book burning, it's a bad thing. Here, it's a really good thing. But here's a very interesting point. These are believers that are coming and confessing, not necessarily past actions, because it's saying disclosing their practices, like current practices. So here's the thing. When you get saved, is everything in your life all of a sudden known and you've turned the corner and you don't continue in anything that God would not want you to continue in right away, automatically, everything. Gradually. It can be a lot of big stuff, but it tends to be as part of the sanctification. As God reveals things to us, we are to change them. And that's what happens. So, for someone who's maybe a little further down the line, when I look at a new believer, am I supposed to like basically throw them out because they haven't changed as much as I think they should change overnight? Mm. I need to have patience and I need to allow for mercy and grace as God allowed mercy. I need to remember I wasn't everything the first day either. On the other hand, I always like to give the balance. Everything I needed to pertaining to life and godliness was given to me at my spiritual birth. But that doesn't mean I'm aware of it all yet. And, but it also does not give us any excuse for hanging on to a practice that we should not be involved in when we do know, once we do know. 
okay? So we gotta just keep that in balance as well. So um, Paul, after this, purposed in his spirit to go to Jerusalem, and this is his plan. Just So he purposed to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Acacia. So again, that's going back over there where Corinth and Athens is, where Berea is and all that, that's that area. That's his purpose. And then he feels like he also should go on to Rome. So if Rome's before or after Jerusalem, it doesn't necessarily say, but he's just, it, it, this is what he purposed in his heart to do um, or purposed in the spirit. So this would be purposed through the Holy Spirit to do. Um, and at this point, he sends away Timothy and Erastus. And this is the first time we've heard of Erastus. He sends them to Macedonia. Remember, Timothy and Silas came from Macedonia, where Paul had been when Paul went to Athens and Corinth. Um, they came from there. Now he's sending them back. Wonder why? Maybe because they know people there. Maybe because they have a ministry there. Maybe because God had it laid on his heart from God to send, Paul had it laid on his heart from God to send them there. I'm sure that was part of it. But he sends them away. He loses their ministry to him. This is, this is hard. Um, and he stays in Asia for a while. Ephesus is in Asia, so remember that. He stays in Asia for a while. And then there's this disturbance that's brought up by a guy named Demetrius, who's a silversmith. I'm way down here at the bottom. You probably can't see it. But anyway, Demetrius... He's a silversmith. Uh, he made shrines of Artemis, who is one of the gods. Um, God, goddess, uh, she's Diana. So I think it's the goddess of war, I think is what, I'm, I'm not exactly sure about the gods and goddesses, but anyway, that's Artemis. Um, and, and he was getting a lot of money off of doing this. So what Paul is doing is messing with his bottom line. <laughs> And he's not happy about it. So he gathers, he rolls up the town. They are literally chanting, 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 you know, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. They don't want his livelihood, but really they don't want their culture to be disturbed. They drag off two people who are with Paul, it says Gaius and Aristarchus, and again, we've never heard of them before, but now we hear they're from Macedonia and they're with Paul. We don't know when they came. We don't know that they might have come with Paul when he went to Athens because we're never told it before, but they're with him now. And it says um, they were um, with him um, from Macedonia and some of the others. And so, anyway, they have this mob scene. And you've got this one man that's pushed forward to speak. Um, I guess they thought he could, his name was Alexander. He probably was prominent and somebody they would listen to. But when they figured out Alexander was a Jew, they started screaming louder. So who comes up after this and speaks? Doesn't even give his name. Town clerk. So here's a town clerk, stands up in this assembly. This is loud. These people are riled up. These people are upset. And he stands up. He gets them to calm down. He list, they listen to him, and he stops. He even says, we're in danger of being accused of a riot in, in connection with today's affair. So it came that close to a riot. This is mob. This is how easily people are stirred up. And... Uh, Paul had wanted to go into the assembly, but he was kept from going for safety's sake. Uh, but apparently, you know, well, as a result of this, they're not killed. Uh, but it's got to be scary. And it shows, it shows how Paul is hitting, the teaching of Paul is hitting at the very basis of false worship, like the worship of Artemis. So we've gone way over our time. I'm sorry about that. Um, there's a lot that was covered here. There's a lot of people, a lot of places. We see Paul on his third missionary journey. We haven't seen the end of that yet. Um, and at this moment, he's only got a couple of people with him, it seems, maybe more, but and maybe we don't know exactly where Luke is. 
Luke's just writing the story. So we're not really exactly sure where he is, but um, we've got these two that are named, um, and I didn't write their names down, but you can, um, that were with Paul. And we see the culture that he's dealing with. We see the resistance to the, from the Jews. We see the resistance even among the Gentiles. I uh, certainly don't like their livelihood affected. So that was this week. We will go into next week looking at chapters 20, just chapter 20, and we'll see. But just keep in mind the patterns that we're seeing from Paul and what that speaks to us. The various circumstances Paul finds himself in, led by the Spirit, how is he responding to them? And also, you've got these wonderful people, Priscilla and Aquila, what do we learn from them? What do we learn from Apollos? What do we learn from those three? And we just need to keep looking and saying, this is not about us knowing some great stories. It's not about us checking off and going, ooh, I'm going through the book of Acts, isn't that great? Aren't I a great person? This is about what is God showing you principles that you can take from this and how it should change your life, how it should change maybe how you deal with things. Who do you know that needs to be taken from what they know to the truth so that they're not left without, that somebody else has to come along and tell them, and you miss the opportunity to love them enough to tell them the truth risking you might risk um so there's a lot of things to contemplate where do i fall in these practices and what do i need to change about my life and don't go necessarily out looking for it as much as being aware and god's going to bring it and and just ask him take these things show me what it is because he has works for you and he made them before the foundation of the world so that you walk in them in this life. And I do too, not just you, I do too. So I'm gonna stop the recording now. Oh, I'll pray and then I'll stop the recording and then I'll start it again for the next part. So I can figure out where, oh, there it is. Okay, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we, we've covered a lot of ground here. You have provided us with some incredible, incredible truths. Help us to know, because a lot of times, Father, we don't see these particular situations. I don't know that I've ever known anybody that was demon-possessed. I wouldn't know, you know, I, so I don't know that I would ever have the, uh, the opportunity to cast out or anything like that. That is not what I think we need to take the specifics from this. I think we need to take the principles. Where do you want us to speak? who comes to our minds you will bring them if we ask you will bring them to our minds and you will bring your word you have said don't worry in the moment what you're going to say just keep taking in your word because the holy spirit will bring it up in the moment and give us the perfect words to say and like paul we may not think we say it well we may do it with fear and trembling and yet we can sit back and we can see the powerfulness of what Paul did, you did through Paul in these places when he didn't know that he was doing such a great job. So we, we understand these things. You, we ask you to help us know what it is you would have us do. We thank you for it all and ask for it all in Jesus' name and for his sake as well. And take us into next week in our study. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Peggy. You're welcome.